There we go. There's the recording started. So yeah, as I said, um, translation studies is a massive part of what we do here in MLang. Um, so much so that if you've studied an undergraduate degree here, which I have, um, then you will know that it is a massive part of the practice of language skills throughout your degree. Um, and given that, we can safely say that those people who are with us today um, have risen to the top of their field and are examining topics that will be relevant to the, translation, the translators of the future. So we're very privileged to have with us today live um, at least three, possibly four speakers. And we also have one asynchronous presentation. Um, now, the first presentation that we have today is um, from somebody who was asked not to be recorded. So I'm going to briefly pause the recording. And for those of you who are not watching live, if you're watching this back on YouTube, um, then you are um, unlikely to, well, you're not going to see this next presentation. So you'll just see a skip. Um, so I'm going to pause the recording now, and then I'll introduce the first speaker. Recording. So I've resumed the recording and our second uh, panelist of today and our first one presenting live is Alex Morgan and Alex is a second year PhD student here at School on Languages and he's writing a thesis on the translation of complex words from Chinese in Welsh. His paper today will be on deciding whether to borrow new words rather than form them using a theory from the 7th century Chinese monk Xuanzang. Alex Croisto Ir Ginhardleth, and we call him a drowty. I hope this works. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, great. Okay, so as um, Joe just said, my dissertation looks at translation of complex Chinese words into Welsh. In most cases, this is happening for the first time. So far, I've only been able to track down one substantial translation of any kind between the two language pairs. So what you would have for most combinations like dictionaries or lexicons or other reference works don't exist in this case. There are many words which simply don't have an equivalent between the two languages. So how do you translate them? Do you transliterate? Do you try to create a translation? Do you do a hybrid of the two? In the seventh century in China, there was a monk called Xuanzang who had to deal with a very similar problem. He was a Buddhist monk who traveled to India over the course of about 17 years and collected several Buddhist scriptures, brought them back to China, and then over another 20 years, translated them with a team of monk translators. Now in China, he's now most famous for appearing in the fantasy novel Journey to the West, where he spends a lot more time fighting monsters than he does translating. But <clears throat> he has a great deal of experience for translating. And we do, by a happy accident of textual history, have a theory that if he didn't write it's at least attributed to him. This is the theory of the five untranslatables. It's very short. In fact, what you can see on the screen now is the theory in its entirety. It is about seven lines long, probably less than 100 characters. Today, it's preserved in various collections of Buddhist scripture. The one that I use in particular is the Japanese Taisho Shinshu Daisokyo, collected by the University of Tokyo, which is the easiest one to search through since it's entirely online. Now, this theory comes in five parts of five different categories of words that Xuanzang felt shouldn't be translated, but rather transliterated. The first is secret. These are religious prayers or chants that, in order to keep their religious effect, need to be kept in the language that they were written. And we can see this today, in a sense, in Islam, in the way that Muslims don't believe that you should translate the Quran. The second category, words with multiple meanings. If a word has too many meanings, then it's easier to keep it as a transliteration rather than try and translate it and capture every meaning in one target language word. Third category, non-existence. If the object in question doesn't exist in the target language or target culture, then it's very difficult to try and explain it. So sometimes it's better to keep it as transliteration. The fourth type is conventions. You might feel that a translation or transliteration is 
does not quite capture the full meaning of the original words, but if there is a convention that is stuck, then it can be too difficult to create a translation for it. The final one is the most difficult one to explain. Various different academics have slightly different takes on it. The general sense being that if the translation doesn't create the same feeling of respect that the original would have, then it's best not to translate it. Now, I have an example for this one of a sentence here about a Viking leader called Ragnar Lothbrok. Um, if you've watched the TV show Vikings, you'll be familiar with who he is. So, set during the Viking Age, Ragnar Saga Lothbrok at Roxona Hans relates the exploits of the legendary warrior and king Ragnar Lothbrok and his sons. Uh, Ragnar is his first name. Lothbrok is not his surname, it is in fact more of a nickname. Now, conventionally, this isn't translated, because if you do translate it, you get this. Set during the Viking Age, Ragnar Saga Lothbrok at Roxona Hans relates the exploits of the legendary warrior and king Ragnar Hairy Breaches and his sons. Or hairy breeches or hairy trousers, if you prefer. So depending on the context, it might make him appear a bit less of a serious and dangerous Viking warrior. So I'm going to give you a few examples of some of the words I've been working with and how the way I translate them is interacted with the theory. So first up, we have Ren. Now this is one of the most important terms from Confucian and ancient Chinese philosophy. And as you can see here, it has many different translations. In fact, Luo here has collected as many as he could find and put them all into a list that's on the screen. So obviously this fits in the rule of um, non-existent or more all, all of these translations from Chinese are going to hit the non-existent rule for Welsh, but it also hits the <clears throat> different meanings rule. So generally you would expect not to translate this because it's hitting two out of the five. I mean, if you're a very serious Confucian, you may even argue it could hit the first one. Second one, wok. And the first issue with this is that wok, as we use it in English and in right, many circumstances you use it in Welsh, but with a spelling change, comes from Cantonese rather than Mandarin. Not only that, but you're only actually translating the second character of the two character words. So it's not a satisfactory translation, but it's a convention. Now, of course, you have the other issue of whether or not in Welsh you want to keep conventions that come from English. But initially, at first sight, again, it's hitting two of the rules. So you'd think maybe you wouldn't want to translate it. Now, the third one, we have Dao. Again, we have a transliteration issue in that you have the original Wade Giles transliteration using a T and the more modern Pinyin using a D. Now, Tao has been conventional for a long time. More people will be more likely to recognize it as Tao than Tao. So it's, do you keep this unsatisfactory um, convention or do you change it? Or if you want to translate it, which way do you pick? I mean, Tao itself in Chinese is actually a very basic character, just meaning way or road. But then you have this other meaning of the philosophical or religious Tao. So once again, you have something with multiple meanings that perhaps you think you wouldn't want to translate. Now we have something a bit more complicated. The weapons on the left are traditional Chinese weapons and on the right, you have more European variants. This is conventionally translated as halberd. Although if you look at the picture, the weapons do appear to have some interesting differences. Now, depending on the context, you might want to just translate it and say that it looks similar enough, it's a weapon, they call them halberds generally, or some kind of pole arm in European languages. So you go with some variation of halberds in your translation. But are they being used the same way? Are they the same weapon? Does this technically counter something that doesn't exist? In which case, would you want to translate it? So this theory does come with positives and negatives. First positive is that, of course, the translators had very broad experience over 
decades, potentially even generations in some monasteries of this kind of translation between two languages and cultures that are very different from each other. The theory is also concise and unambiguous. It either fits into these categories or it doesn't. Of course, it being concise also means that it's quite brief and there isn't so much explanation of it. Not only that, but it was only intended to focus on one genre, in this case, translation of Buddhist texts. And even then, if they did choose not to translate it, but transliterate it, many of the monks would be able to understand Sanskrit anyway, so it wouldn't have been such an issue for them keeping it in the original. So, in conclusion, the way that I see this theory working isn't so much a broader theory like we think of like non-equivalence or um, Venuti's domestication and foreignization, but rather as a method. And if you can hit one of the five categories, then maybe you could get away with translating it. Because if you start hitting more of them, then it becomes more difficult to justify. It also depends on other theories you are using. So for example, if you want to go for a more foreignizing translation, then you would consider that if it's hitting too many of these categories, then you transliterate it. Or if you want to domesticate, then maybe you wouldn't worry so much about transliteration. And in my language combination in particular, a lot of these words appear, some of these words appearing in Welsh have come through English first. So then you have the issue of whether or not you want to take conventions from a third party language, or you would rather go directly to the Chinese, which would then avoid some of the problems with conventions, but then give you more problems with whether or not these words exist. Thank you. Uh, so I stop sharing. Um, sorry, how do I get off the share screen? There you go. Is that done it? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I don't know. I'm not very good with these tech things, but I think I was able to sort of override you there. But thanks so much, Alex. That's, that was really interesting. Um, any questions for Alex, um, please put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll pick up on them and we will come back to them at the end. We're going to have all of our panelists participate in the Q&A um, in around about half an hour's time. Um, so it's about time that we move on to our second panelist, um, which is, if I am correct, I will just double check who it is. It should be Banda. Is Banda still here? He is. Um, so, um, yeah, our next, our next panelist is Banda Al-Talidi, um, and Banda is a second year PhD student here at MLang. He teaches at King Khalid University as well and has been translating and subtitling with non-profit organizations such as Translators Without Borders and Translation Commons. He's also been named the deputy lead for the Transnational Cultural and Visual Research theme here in the school. His thesis applies the sociological theories of Pierre Bourdieu to Saudi fan subbers. And for anybody who doesn't know what fan subbers are, don't worry. I'm sure he'll explain very shortly because his paper today is, is titled Fan Subbing from a Socio Digital Perspective. Banda, it's wonderful to have you here. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> just. Um... Can you see this now, the slides? Okay, let's list this thing uh, end first. I don't know what does that mean, okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe, for introducing me. I'm happy to be here today. Um, so as, as you can see, uh, my presentation today about fan subbing uh, and social media from a socio-digital uh, perspective or paradigm. Uh, let's just start with um, fan subbing. So basically fan subbing means uh, a fan translation, which is done for fans. So other words for fan subbing could be fan, fan subtitling or non-professional uh, subtitling. So that's the... Uh, symbol that's the definition of it there there are different types and definition that have been ad, um, identified by some scores but this is the basic and simple one 
Um, so today I will be talking about uh, my my thesis, and specifically I will talk about some of my, the thesis aims and and research questions, and a brief um, description about the sociology of translation studies, uh, Bourdieu sociology, and I will be uh, talking about the research methods. Then I will be specifically uh, talk about social media fan subbing. Then I'll present uh, some preliminary uh, observations uh, and results. So um, my thesis uh, aims to study and map the history of subtitling practice in Saudi Arabia. So it gave like a historical background about um, subtitling uh, in the country and individual translation in the country over uh, the years up to um, 2020. With that, it gives me an idea about the uh, subtitling field uh, from, from a sociological perspective. Uh, second, it explores the structure and dynamics of fan subbing in digital media, which is an interesting uh, case in, in, in the country of uh, Saudi Arabia. So I will be studying fan subbing uh, in, in, in digital media only, not fan subbing like in websites and, and, and blogs and anime fan subbing. So this is a special case. Uh, and finally, it studies the social and digital presence and agency of fan subbers. And I, I'll come to the uh, notion of agency um, now. Um, so uh, the research questions uh, of my, my thesis, there is uh, one main strategic questions uh, or question, uh, which is uh, what are the socio-digital dynamics of uh, the subtitling field and fan subbing subfield uh, in Saudi Arabia? Uh, this is followed by four sub questions, as you can see, and each one has a specific um, element or character that it will be focused on. Um, I don't want to go into the um, uh, questions now because I want to spend more time on other um, uh, slides. Okay, um, now to the sociology of translation. Uh, so previous studies uh, and the literature suggest a few a few a few points that I could uh, can share here today. So um, translation studies or translation is uh, an interdisciplinary uh, field that use and export many like approaches and methodology from other fields and that help the researchers to expand and study some of the translation practices and phenomena uh, that we encounter or see in, in, in translation. Um, there has been uh, or there have been numerous turns or shifts in focus uh, in research and, and practice in, in translation studies, uh, which uh, informed the, uh, the theoretical and methodological approach in translation studies. Namely, we can uh, say that the social turn uh, is one of the um, uh, most obvious uh, turns that, that shape the uh, focus uh, of research in translation studies. Uh, what this turn suggests that translation is understood as a social activity and translation as social agents. So an agent uh, means that the translator has the ability to have a voice, to exert a power. Um, uh, from that perspective, uh, translation is represented as a social uh, activity. And now there has been different sociological approaches that has been used uh, in, in, in translation, but the clear example is the sociology of Bourdieu, which has been applied by different scholars and used in different sessions. Um, from the, the uh, previous accounts on, on, on literature review, there has been a very clear gaps in research. The first one is that there is no clear um, mention of a sociology of individual translation or sociology of non-professional uh, translation, which means that it's still re less represented in research on, on, on sociology of translation studies. The second one is that the research on translation in general and individual translation in the country of Saudi Arabia is beyond expectation. And 
for this case or for my thesis, the sociology of or fan subbing, it's barely mentioned or established. So this this thesis tries to um, cover that uh, gap. Now to the um, theoretical uh, framework of my thesis, which is Bourdieu sociology. Uh, well, we can say that Bourdieu's uh, sociology present a balanced uh, sociological understanding of the um, um, social practice of, or of any uh, social act that uh, a researcher wants to study. Um, so it, it, it uh, reconciles the gap between uh, what he called structure and agency. So it tries to um, study the, any, any, any subject in whole without focusing on one part and forgetting the other, the other one. So it studies the structure and the individual. Uh, so like a translator and the context this translator is working on. He presents very um, essential, three uh, essential concepts. The concept of field, uh, which studies the structure of the, um, um, the subject matter, for example, uh, fan subbing. It's a structure. Who is dominant or who, uh, who are the main players in this, in this uh, structure? So who is dominant, who is dominated? And it studies also the competition between different uh, parties in this in this uh, structure, but it also see the the struggle between these fan subbers and the the um, form of capital they're trying to uh, accumulate within time. Uh, then the concept of habitus, which is um, studies the individual um, experience, lives, and socialization. So it's it's like a history of individuals. Uh, it's like a biography. Uh, then the uh, concept of capital, with which I think um, some of you may uh, know this uh, as usual. So we have the economic, which is the maybe most uh, clear one. But there are different types of capital that can be studied as well. So we have culture, we have social, uh, we have digital, we have religious, and other types that you could uh, expand on. Uh, so the, the, the uh, capital is what makes fan subbers um, like participate in, in, in fan subbing and, 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 and in the structure on a field and keep them going and competing against each other. Um, so um, to answer the research questions, um, uh, my research takes the form of mixed method approach. Uh, but I would like to mention that uh, Bourdieu um, talk about an important thing that all sociological approaches are historical, which means that you have to start with a historical uh, analysis of the subject matter that you are studying. Uh, and that Bourdieu itself presents, or Bourdieu sociology presents itself as a theory and a methodology at the same time. Um, so um, the, uh, this thesis takes uh, three phases of data collection. So first one, a historical analysis, which is about the subtitling field in Saudi Arabia, and also the uh, fan subbing subfield uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, then a more deep content analysis, in which I collected data about 27 fan subbers, Saudi fan subbers, from Twitter. So here I'm focusing on Twitter as the main source of data. So I collected uh, data about their subtitle clips, how many, what they are about, the genre, how long, the duration, uh, what paratextual and, um, features they are using, like using hashtags, using ads, etc. Uh, the third one is a survey. So uh, questions to the, these fan subbers about their lives, their choice of um, like strategy when translating, um, the capital they're trying to accumulate, their lifestyles. So th the survey tries to answer the capital and habitus, which are very interesting uh, or important aspects of my research. Uh, here's uh, what I call social media fan subbing. So I just um, um, mentioned this uh, case study just to clarify. So these are um, uh, uh, snapshots of two uh, fan subbers 
who translate the same clip and on the same day uh, and got different results. Uh, just let me, um, yeah. So is, as you can see, if, if you compare these uh, two, two pictures against each other, you can see that the differences between number of views, number of replies, retweets, uh, and likes between the two uh, fan subbers. Also, the, 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 um, the use of hashtags is very important uh, features of, of fan subbers on social media. Uh, in which they try to uh, use the trendy uh, hashtags at the time. Uh, but also the ticks itself uh, is a very interesting thing because sometimes these fan subbers use the ticks as um, a tool to uh, attract audience. And like it works like introduction to the clip itself. Um, the duration of the clips. So one is about 10 minutes, the other one is just three minutes but everyone gets a different engagement uh, from, from, the, uh, from the audience. Even they are very uh, famous and influential uh, fan subbers in Saudi Arabia, but they got different results. And this is just the case because I have 27 other fan subbers I can compare um, against each other. So this is social media fan subbing. Why I, I say social media? Because as you know, there is enemy fan subbing and there is... Uh, film and serious fan subbing but this is a special case this is a fan subbing that is done only on social media specifically twitter with short clips no more than 10 minutes and they use different strategy to attract um, the saudi audience and the saudi uh, twitter users by choosing the general that's most relevant to the saudi audience sometimes political sometimes just cultural sometimes even just educational clips. Um, finally, let me just talk about some uh, basic or preliminary observations because I haven't done uh, much analysis at this stage of my research. But I can say that the subtitling field in Saudi Arabia has not been studied or even established as a history. Uh, and that's uh, an extra effort uh, on me at the time. Um, there are very um, obvious socio and, and, and sociological and cultural developments in the country of Saudi Arabia, which are um, very relevant to the research and has impacted the uh, future of individual translation and, and, and media studies, such as um, COVID-19 is an example. There is um, uh, Saudi Fijian 2030 and the reformal opinion in the country or openness to other cultures. Uh, third thing that um, social media is, has a special case in Saudi Arabia, especially Twitter, as it is the main platform for like mutual communication between government and, 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 and the uh, Saudi nation. But it's also the main um, platform for getting news to engaging with each other. So it represents a, a case uh, or a, a unique case um, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, Social media fan subbing takes different forms. So you could find some educational clips, political clips, cultural, or even responding to some crisis situations. Um, there is no obvious struggle, uh, sorry, there is an obvious struggle between um, fan subbers over selecting clips, uh, over using of hashtags, over some sponsorships, some, some fan subbers use uh, sponsorships from other uh, parties also use different forms. So you could side, find one fan subber who focus only on Twitter, but you could find another one who use like uh, Twitter, YouTube, um, Telegram, and another form of, of platforms to diversify um, his capital. Uh, there is dominant and dominated fan subbers. So those, uh, there are veterans, there are newcomers, and everyone of, with different strategies. Um, in terms of capital, every every one has a different form of capital he tried to accumulate. So those are those veterans may be looking now for cultural capital because they, they have the money. They don't want money, they want cultural, they want to be known. Uh, other newcomers may look for uh, economic capital, etc. So this is just some main uh, outcomes of, of, of the research. Uh, all right, that's about my research today. Thank you so much for listening. <clears throat> uh, 
Well, thanks so much, Banda. That's really fascinating. I had no idea about these fan samples beforehand, and I'm sure people will have plenty of questions. If you have any um, questions at all for Banda or uh, for any of our other panellists, then please put them in the Q&A or in the chat, and we'll address them at the end of the panel in the Q&A session. Um, so without further ado, let's move on to our next panellist, which is um, Abdullah Al Alkani. Um, now, Abdullah obtained a BA degree in the English language from King Khalid University in Saudi Arabia and was subsequently appointed as a teaching assistant in translation studies in the Department of the English Language. Um, in 2018, he had a he got a BA in translation studies from the University of Leicester and then was appointed to be a lecturer in translation studies at the University of Bisha. His PhD thesis uses Bourdieu's sociological model to investigate the genesis and current position of English self-help literature translated into Arabic in Saudi Arabia as a socially situated activity. And the title of his paper today is Translation of English Self-Help Literature into Arabic from a Sociocultural Perspective. Abdullah, thanks so much for being with us today. And uh, thanks so much for popping in to see me earlier. Um, I know you're downstairs in Emlang and I'm upstairs. Um, over to you. I'm looking forward to it. You're on mute, I believe, Abdullah. Oh, so, so, sorry. Thank you, Joe, for, for, for the introduction and happy to be with you today uh, to share with you my uh, research or uh, on, offer a few of my research. Just let me just share my screen. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, uh, the title of my research is Sociological Perspectives on the Translations of English self help Literature in Saudi Arabia. Uh, why I have uh, decided to study uh, self-help literature or the translation of self-help literature, I actually uh, have a personal interest in this genre and the translation of this genre. This genre emerged in the um, 1880s uh, in the Arab world and in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in 1982, uh, the most, uh, it's also the most translated genre in the Arab world, which is, um, which stands for one third of the translation in Saudi Arabia. And this also can be, uh, can be also said about the Arab world. Uh, the third point is the large presence of, of the translated English literature and the Saudi field of cultural production that can be seen in, in the large section allocated to self-help literature in the bookstores. Also the widespread of uh, self-help training courses that adopts uh, the content of self-help uh, books and also the abundance of uh, advertisement campaigns uh, of self-help books and training course, both online and uh, on-site. Uh, more importantly, the appeal of self-help literature to the people uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, after uh, having said that, it's uh, this this like this uh, genre is largely unexplored. Uh, there are only few studies; uh, most of them are MA studies, focusing on um, analyzing a book or self-help book. Uh, and, but the problem is that there's a number of controversial claims that have been made about the structure and dynamics of this, uh, or the translation activity of self-help literature. Uh, so what's self-help literature? I know self-help literature uh, by itself is, is uh, complex and still uh, controversial, but I try to be more practical and to find the most practical uh, definition that I can use to identify what kind of books that I will use although I, I will study. So uh, uh, I found this uh, definition uh, practical. It's a book of popular nonfiction uh, written with the aim of enlightening readers about some of the negative, uh, negative effects of our culture uh, worldwide uh, or worldview and uh, suggesting new attitudes and practices that might 
uh, lead them uh, to more satisfying and more effective lives. Uh, another definition is a book that are written for, and this is important, lay people to help individual uh, cope with problems and live more effective lives. That's simply the, the, the definition of self-help uh, books uh, or literature. Uh, the history uh, also is controversial, but I found that um, uh, the author uh, or the writing of some authors, some, some famous author, and generally or mostly the, the, the bio, their biographies of these authors like establish the setting uh, for the emergence of self-help literature, as you can see, like Benjamin Franklin, and here like you can see like Abraham Lincoln uh, and other, uh, and Samuel Smile, and we will mention this here. Uh, Chiri argues that uh, the term itself, self-help, was attached for the first time to, to self-help literature uh, in 1859 by uh, the author Samuel Smile when he introduced his books uh, titled Self-Help. This is the cover of the book by Samuel Smile. And this is the first translation uh, of that book into Arabic, which was done in 1880 uh, under the title of Kitab Sir Najah, The Secret of Success book by Yaqub Sarruf, and he was encouraged by the well-known uh, translator and Bible translator, uh, Cornelius Van Dyck. Uh, my research question is, uh, what are the socio-cultural and historical factors that have influenced and governed the translation activity? of the field of translated English self-help literature into Arabic in Saudi Arabia and how they have influenced the different translation process in the field. Uh, our, in the beginning, uh, our, in the first year, I tried to cover all the Arab uh, world countries, but I couldn't uh, due to the time and space limit. So I decided to focus on Saudi Arabia, which is the most like, uh, because most of the translation of self-help books was done in Saudi Arabia based on my preliminary uh, research. Uh, I covered the period from the establishment, uh, establishment of the country until 2016. Uh, I used uh, Bourdieu's uh, theory of social practice and uh, his concepts uh, like, uh, or namely field, agent, capital, and habitus. I opt for this uh, theory because it provides uh, a theoretical and methodological framework that allow me to investigate the genesis of the field um, and its agents, and this is very important, and also the sociocultural motivations that lead to the emergence and heavy presence of this uh, genre. This is just an example of applying Podio. Podio allows me to uh, contextualize my field within different, uh, within different like subfield uh, uh, within the Saudi field of cultural production. You, as you can see here, field of, field of publishing, field of translation, field of self uh, literature. And here is my field where I can see that different intersects between different powers and the struggle I can, uh, so I can study um, the practice and the process of translation within this context. And as, as you can see also as uh, Bodhi suggested within the uh, bigger or wider uh, Saudi field of power, which contains economic and political. Uh, another uh, like contextualization of Bodhi, uh, of, of, of my field that I can use um, uh, is to contextualize my field within the field of translation and within the bigger field of publishing. Uh, we, so we can see the field of translation as a part of of, of field of pub, uh, publishing. It, it depends that, that depends on the country, but again, uh, this is why I have notes in Saudi Arabia is most of the translation is done within the field of publishing. Uh, so I contextualize my field within the field, 
translation, which is part of the field of publishing. Uh, I, used, uh, I also used uh, uh, a mixed methods that suggest by body and I have uh, developed myself. Uh, I used uh, a bibliographical analysis, uh, which allow me to map the, and to collect all the books that are translated that have been translated into Arabic uh, since the beginning of, of establishment of the country till 2016. Then I uh, move and select the most or the, 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 the dominant or the most important agent within, within the field. Uh, I used uh, biographical through uh, interviewing the active uh, translation agents or producers. Uh, the final stage uh, is a contextual analysis, which is to see the implications and manifestations of uh, of the field itself and the agents and the struggle between the agents, the capital they strive to for or the, their habitus on the final product, which will be seen in the contextual analysis. Uh, my research contribution, which is the final uh, final point in my uh, presentation, is uh, will be to divide into two into two sections. The first one uh, to the field of uh, translated English self help literature into Arabic. Uh, um, I will uh, I. I or I map the field of translated English literature, as I said, by collecting all the books, it's around 1,000 books, the bibliographical data of 1,000 uh, self-help books translated into Arabic, and also uh, the agents, analyzing the agents through the interviews, and also the type of capital or types of capital uh, which they strive for, the mode of volume of activity in the field, and uh, the individual uh, and institutional agents' habits. I also uh, trying to identify the main soci uh, sociocultural and historiopolitical factors influencing the translation activity in the field of translating uh, translated English literature. Uh, also identifying the main historical phases, which is very important. Uh, the main historical uh, phases of the field. Uh, that will allow me to to categorize my uh, or the practice of the translation um, during different uh, historical phases. Uh, the second kind of contribution is contribution to the sociology of translation. Uh, I'm also evaluating and assessing the value of body theory of social practice uh, to the study of English self-help literature when translated into Arabic in the context of uh, Saudi Arabia because body apply apply his theory to uh, European or French context. I'm now trying to apply it to a Saudi context. Uh, also, I'm trying to introducing and evaluating the, uh, uh, of the efficiency of bibliographic data and bibliographic analysis as socio-historical method of research applied to the sociology of translation studies and integrating this tool with additional uh, methods, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, such as interviews, archival research, and textual and paratextual analysis. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you so much, uh, Abdullah, for that fascinating presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions at all um, for Abdullah or for any of the other panelists, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and we will ask them at the end. But having said that, um, we've got some unfortunate news that um, Ayed, who was going to be our final um, panelist this afternoon, unfortunately can't attend um, because he's had to deal with a family emergency. So um, what that means is that we will, I'd imagine, move straight on to the Q&A session um, because... Um, we don't have any further panelists. Um, so um, what I will do is ask um, all of our panelists to just uh, make sure they're not muted and um, that they can, they can hear everything. And um, 
if anybody has any questions at all for any of the panelists about any of the papers that we've heard in this panel, then please feel free to um, to put them in the chat or the Q&A and we will pick up on them. Um, the first one that we have is from um, Liz Ren Owens, who has a question for Alex. Um, and Alex is, um, Alex is, well, the question from Liz to Alex is, um, she says, very interesting paper, Alex. Do you know if any of the Buddhist centers in Wales have developed versions of the terminology in Welsh as part of their practice? Well, I'm not actually looking at Buddhist translation as a source text. I was just using the theory. Um, I imagine if they have, though, they'd probably have gone straight for the Sanskrit versions rather than Chinese since Indian or to a lesser extent, Japanese Buddhism tends to be more popular in the West. Uh, it would be something interesting to look into. Certainly, it's just not one of the source texts I'm using for what I'm translating. Well, I have a question for Banda, if that's all right. Um, Banda, you said, if, I, if I'm right, you've got 27 case studies. Is that right? Yes. How did, you, how did you decide to come to exactly 27 case studies? Um, did you narrow it down from a smaller range or was there um, a sort of theory behind how you narrowed down exactly which case studies you were going to pick? Well, uh, that's a good question because it's, um, it's hard to trace fan servers online and, and find who uh, subtitled and who's not because they like use different names, not um, clear names or real names sometimes. But this has started um, even before doing my MA because I've been following some, some fan servers since then. Um, it's started like an observation. So from time to time, I notice a different name come, up, come to the surface and start subtitling or fan subbing. Uh, then one fan subber leads to the another. Um, why 27? There is a criteria behind that. So all 27 um, have to be uh, Saudis, have to be subtitling at least um, 10 clips and have already posted them on, on, uh, on Twitter. Um, they are like um, available. So they're, they're and, and active. So they're not suspended or, or something. So there is no way to say that um, I selected them just because it was easy to just pick up and choose. So it was like during a period of observation. So I, I had to, to, to select it. Plus that the data shows that those are the most, um, let's say, famous or visible fan suburbs in Saudi Arabia. Because if you um, <clears throat> ask any Saudi about name, just one fan or a subtitler or even a translator, they will pick one of those ones. So all these are just indicators. It's hard to say that you can, you can look for fan servers online. I think anyone couldn't. If, like if you say, give me a name of like um, 10 people who are famous for doing something online, you can't find those very easily. So you have to um, look for them over time. So I think that answers your, your question. No, yeah, yeah that, that does answer my question. Thanks very much. Um, and um, Abdullah, um, you mentioned in your presentation that you, um, you were assessing your research from in the point of view of a uh, field within the field of publishing. But you said just before that, quite briefly, that you were assessing it also from the field of political influence from Saudi Arabia, if I've got that right. Um, could you explain what you mean by that? Or could you clarify if I've got that slightly wrong? I 
I hello. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. yeah. I think you mean the slide. Is that right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Cultural yeah. production. I was talking about not not political influence. I'm getting confused. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could we clarify what you mean a bit more about Saudi Saudi cultural production in that context? Yeah. Actually, um, as both you suggested, uh, there, there there will be always um, influence of the field of power, either economic. Uh, uh, economic, political, or even religion uh, on the field of culture production. Uh, what we mean here, we mean like, for example, when we talk about uh, political, like sometimes the regulations, the regulations of, of the country and the laws of, for example, the, in our country, for example, the, 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 the Ministry of, of, of Media, like, has a regulation for publishing uh, books. So you need to follow this regulation to, to publish the book or even the translations. Uh, so this is, this is, uh, this is uh, the context where I study, and this is uh, provided by, by, by Bodhi, and, and this is a, a contribution to, to my study or facilitate my understanding of, because I, I, don't, I don't want all, uh, only to look at the translation practices or process um, without looking at the society that, or where the translation is, uh, the translation is, is taking place. So, so this is why I, I this is what, just one imagination of, of, of uh, how can I contextualize my, my field? And this that, that another one. Uh, for me, I, I, I prefer this one, uh, as I said, because uh, my field or translation in general in Saudi Arabia is about May or generally or mainly is a part of, of publishing. Um, um, but again, uh, this, uh, this board you understanding or board you theory understand that uh, the field of power always have influence uh, and uh, influence on, on, that, on, the, on the whole uh, field of culture production. So just taking that theory um, one step further then, the when when you talk about specifically the, the Saudi field of cultural production, mm. what kind what specific influences does that have on on publishing and on uh, on on your work? Can you name any particular examples? Yeah, yeah, we, we can we can talk about uh, censorship, like uh, what kind of book uh, are allowed to be translated. Uh, we can talk about. Uh, the dominant, uh, the dominance and dominated agents. We, we can talk, for, for example, if you have like a uh, connection with 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 other governmental bodies, you will be uh, you, will, you will have more uh, opportunity to 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 have uh, to have more portion or more capital in the field. If you if you have, for example, connection with people in the Ministry of Media, if you have, for example. Uh, they will facilitate the, 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 the regulation or uh, they will make it uh, or speed up the process of, of publishing a book, for example. Uh, it also depends on uh, your social capital, for example, uh, within, within, within the field, if you are famous or not. Uh, sometime, uh, if you are well known, your book will be published uh, uh, like more quick than other, other uh, writers. Or other translators, uh, because you are famous, uh, this can facilitate uh, your uh, like your works. So, it, uh, there is especially in, in our context, on the Arabic context, there will be always a connection, uh, or, or uh, all part of, of cultural production will be will be uh, will be taking place within the field of, of power, because the, uh, the field of power has control if almost everything like uh, uh, on the on the field of cultural production so it's not like in the west um, like uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want like to just uh, compare but again it depends on the political situation in different countries but this is what again what, what uh, board you allows me to to do is that to contextualize my my field Within these uh, all uh, within these like uh, within these different we can call it so, uh, sociological uh, 
uh, motivation that influence the translation practices. Sorry, I'm on mute now. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that makes that makes perfect sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, Christopher Hood has a, uh, a question for Alex, or, or sort of maybe something that you might want to comment on, Alex. Um, he says, a very interesting presentation. You might want to look at the discussion in relation to Japanese loan words. I'm not going to try and pronounce that. But I think it's, well, I, I'm trying to pronounce it, but I don't think I'm going to get it right. Garaigo, um, from other languages. Most of these uh, maintain some version of the original pronunciation, but there are also words and concepts that are translated into Japanese, often with Chinese characters. So they give the appearance of being a Japanese word. This doesn't mean that the concept is understood in the same way. Um, and he gives an example of um, shukyo, which is a Japanese word meaning religion, but the concept doesn't map neatly with the English word. Has that got any semblance with your research, Alex? Um, would you like to comment on, on um, whether you found something similar um, in Chinese? Well, I have actually been looking at translation from Japanese, but more in the context of Meiji era translations from Western languages. Um, um, I was going to compare them with the way that in Western countries have formed scientific words with elements from Latin and Greek. So it, it is something that I have been look, looking into, um, whether or not I go with the more Meiji option or the original Chinese words option, I don't know yet. I mean, I've only got so many words I can do with this. Uh, yeah, it, it is an area that I have been looking into. Great. Um, I, I've got another question for Banda, if that's all right. Um, this, is, this one's from Liz Ren Owens. Um, she says, thanks for your paper. And have you come across any instances where the fan subbers work together to build cultural capital or where fan subbers work is acknowledged by or seems to shape the direction of production companies' policies in the same way that some of the success of fan subbers of Japanese products encourage the companies to break into the Anglophone markets. Um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Liz, for this um, last question, uh, actually. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, this is start by answering the, 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 the last part of the question. I don't think that fan subbing in the context of Saudi Arabia has reached the, the, the um, or equal the Japanese um, um, type. Uh, so fan subbing in Saudi Arabia is more of um, <clears throat> social media act. It's like celebrity based activity. So it doesn't have that kind of activist movement against any form of um, or to the uh, production companies. Um, but if we look to other types of fan subbing, maybe like um, website-based fan subbing who subtitle um, films and, and, and series, that could be the case. But that's beyond my, uh, my area of, of, of study here. Uh, in terms of collectives or, or fan subbers uh, work together to build a cultural capital. Um, I remember in, in my EMA, I studied a um, volunteer uh, group who subtitled, um, collectively subtitled um, educational clips. Um, but at the time, it wasn't my focus on, on, on Bodhi's theory at all. But now, I can think of that case um, of, of in, in this in this sense. So I, I, I agree that they could have some sort of um, cultural capital or any, any any form of other capitals. But this is very very interesting questions uh, to be to be thinking about maybe in, in in the future or maybe integrate it in in, in my research as well. Thank you, Liz, again. Thanks so much, Banda. Um, I've got one more question for Alex. Um, I think this will probably be the last question um, of the panel, if that's okay, unless anybody has any more that I've missed. Um, I was just wondering about when you described um, the, the theories of Xuanzang as, as a method. Um, do, does that method, do you think, apply best to the Chinese language um, and to translations from Chinese? Or do you think it is applicable across the board 
um, in similar ways? How, how does it map onto other? I mean, this would be a simple example, but say, for example, between transition from English to Welsh or vice versa. I mean, there's nothing in it that's specifically about Chinese. It's more different kinds of words rather than anything that would be more common for one particular language. I mean, it tends to, if you're going to say it's restricted to something, it tends to fit more towards like religious translation. I mean, the first case, obviously, the uh, words that have religious significance, that's only going to be used for religion. Um, for using it in objects, it depends, I suppose. I mean, of course, this theory was written down about 1,400 years ago, so people didn't travel so much. There wasn't anything like the internet back then, so you can look these up and show people, like, look, this is what I'm trying to translate. This is the object. So I, I wouldn't say it is based on just this language combination, but rather more based on translation of a particular genre of text. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for your questions and also for obviously to all of our panellists uh, for their wonderful presentations and also to Carrie, who couldn't be here today. But um, 